the last contrivance I put into a decision, I find the more graceful the outcome. So I, I kind of, I, 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 my life is like riding on water and, and, uh, and it fades away quicker than I can read the trails. Bravo, man. Bravo. <laughs> hey, Robert, you were just saying how in giving it to us straight, you were saying there's really nothing to, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, but there, there's really nothing to attain. That, that you is doing nothing and I heard it there, can really do nothing. Okay, there's nothing to attain um, is a question that the non-duality people are always fighting about. And it's a wrong view to make that into a goal or a, or a, a, a description of some um, favorable state. It isn't. It's a certain understanding. But if you feel there's something to attain, then the only sensible thing to do is attain it. And when you have finally attained enough attainments, then uh, what John was just talking about, the transitory nature of experience will hopefully by that time have become clarified. Not by words that some spirituality teacher uttered, but by your own repetition of desire of fulfillment, desire of fulfillment, eventually that will just um, wear thin. And although that may sound boring, it actually isn't. It's really great to just be. And that's what I have tried to say in my work here, that it's not about attaining what someone else describes as a enlightened or fulfilled state. It's about you being able to sit at home in your chair with the TV set off and be okay. And that's, that is enlightenment. <laughs> uh, don't take that as gospel. I'm not sitting here defining enlightenment for anyone, but that's how it looks to me. Um, I don't think enlightened people are these special humans who are above the rest of us. It's not like that. That's a kind of strange fantasy. Um, any comments on that or new questions? Well, I mean, just to follow up on that, the, 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 the whole Chinese thumb puzzle trick here is that we show up here at these talks or reading these books with a particular stance or strategy in mind and we hear the message and we turn that into part of our strategy so we never actually hear the message I, I, I... I missed your last sentence. We turned that into, and then I couldn't. Strategy. We turned that into part of the strategy that we came looking for. Strategy to, to, to do what? To, to be happy. To understand, to be happy, to attain enlightenment, whatever no. it may be. So it's not really a striving for enlightenment, uh, Oz, if I understand this. It's a wanting to be happy. Is that more? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's my particular flavor of it. Yeah, well, that's a that's a that's a very common feeling, um, and on the face of it, it seems like a worthy goal. It really does. It's hard to say to someone if someone says to you, "I just want to be happy." It's hard to say that's a crummy idea. I mean, you know, it's, of course you want to be happy. We all do, whatever that means. 
It means different things to different people, quite different. But the point is that in what I'm calling awake or awakening, you understand that that's not up to you. You have nothing to do with it. See, people might say, eat a vegan diet, have sex three times a week, go to the gym, whatever it is, and then you'll be happy. And then you'll get, you know, and yeah, you get, if you're fortunate, you get that. You get the nice girlfriend and you, you can afford the dues at the gym or something and you're feeling pretty buff, you know? And that's your happiness. Yes? It's what you pursued. And you got it. You're one of the fortunate ones who swam upstream and made it. <laughs> so now you're in that vagina. That has to wear out. Not that I tell you some magic word that robs you of your life, which is what's happening in spirituality. That's why I'm speaking out against it with this apparent vehemence, which isn't really vehemence, it's compassion. I see that many intelligent people are deluded in this sense of pursuing something outside of oneself, but there isn't anything out there. It's all you. Everything you see is you, clearly. That's not a radical, most of you have read my book. I thought the arguments for that part of it were pretty much irrefutable, that we're making our world by our attitudes, our previous experiences, and all the rest of it. That seems self-evident. And um, that's nothing that we control. See, when I say I'm making my world, I don't mean that I can just dream up any world I want and there it is. That's, this, that's the bill of goods that the highest yogis who have perfected these non-human <laughs> uh, cities are trying to sell you. You become enlightened, you, you know, 20 years stare at the wall and you'll have higher reasoning powers also. Right. Well, what? Yeah, happiness. It's a it's a looking for a uh, a release and an understanding that makes sense of the experience experiences that I had. Or, you know, so when when one sort of experiences what you were describing there as, you know, maybe um, your own absence in a sense. Um, and you have that sort of free sample. You want it back. And so there's a kind of a flavor of happiness that you're looking for after that, which is reattaining and understanding that transcendental happy experience that you got. That's perfect. That's perfectly said. Uh, so that's that's it. You you want to get back there, but there is no getting back, and we all really know that. It's it's just once upon a once. You know, right. and, and, and so don't let that one hang hang you up. Um, you know, you're asking me about attainment. The thing to attain, if there's going to be any attainment at all, is not happiness. If you want to attain something, attain openness to this moment and all it contains without resistance. Robert? This is exactly what you talk about with suchness. The more present you are, the more, the less you are yourself thinking about where you are and everything else. The more you are actually in that moment, 
then I think, like we said before, about having to make a decision if a decision needs to be made. The closer you are to being in that moment, the more likely that decision you make will will be a successful one or a be, or, or one or the best possibility. But the whole thing seems to me to be exactly as you said often of experiencing that the more you experience the moment there's less of anybody experiencing you're just there that's it something is there something is looking does that make any sense say something john crawley please i would say there's nothing <laughs> Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one of the, the issues with, not that there's any issues really, but <clears throat> when you have a spiritual experience this extraordinary, it was really illuminated by just simply presence, then there is a temptation for a redo or a repeat of that experience like it's your goal. And all that does is take you away from the presence that was actually illuminating the mind and the world when there wasn't so much contrivance involved. So when you have a spiritual experience, then here comes the contrivance seeking for a redo, and it's a mantra of doubt. So you're clinging to a fixed idea about an experience, and that is self-defeating, in my opinion, or, or I found it so in my own case, because I've, I've, I've exercised that to the point of exhausting all of those kind of remedies. <clears throat> so... All spiritual experience is a once upon a once and no more so-called spiritual than brushing your teeth. Uh, I'd like to make a comment on non-duality too. Non-duality is really pretty simple. It's dreamless sleep. It's forever before you were born. It's what happens when they put you under anesthesia. No different than a novel nervous couple samadhi. All the same. That's non-duality. All this other stuff, talking about non all of that is is just learned ignorance. There's no there's no real fathoming in 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 that trying to grasp dreamless sleep. It can't be done. So <clears throat> so you give up. You give up. Forget it, forget the search, forget all of that, and be as you are. That's enough. Oh, that's it's. I'm so happy you're here, John. I really, this is great. This is this is a for me, this is a, a continuation of a conversation that we had several times in uh, North Carolina, and it's it's just like we picked up, picked up exactly where we left off, no different at all. It's great. I've got to say, I've got to say before I open the floor again, this for me, this is just an amazing experience. All these great people, I, I see you on my screen um, from all over the place. It's uh, just extraordinary. So thank you for being here. Violet? Yes, this sir. Is, this is Simmer. Um, when Oz, opened up his statement, one of the words that he used was strategy, um, which to me is, and, and you know, we came to that conclusion, is obviously not what we're looking for. It's not what the heart uses at all. And I will put in the place of the word strategy, the word curiosity. So he said something about we come to this meeting with a strategy. And I would say I come to this meeting with a curiosity to see what's around me, what's around you, actually, and what's around the people that are here. 
So I've been working, you know, with being, living as curiosity. And that seems to take the edge off of, um, it, first of all, it brings me to presence because I can be curious about whatever is in front of me. Um, and I feel that that's not my ego being curious. Yeah, my ego wants to know. Being curious is just being open. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's, thank you. That's really beautiful, Shimmer. It's, um, that's another aspect of what I was mentioning um, earlier. If you're going to have a goal, have that one be the goal, not to be happy. Because I think happiness just comes and goes like the wind in the trees. When it's there, enjoy it. It won't always be. I, I remember when I was uh, studying with a, a cult group in New York that I did have some absolutely incredible experiences. And at the same time, I remember reading uh, in, in Search of the Miraculous uh, with Ospensky, and he said, which also I, I think is, is correct, is that these, they happen and then they go away. But if you are looking to repeat it, it can't happen because you only had them when you were completely open. And if you're looking to repeat an experience, then you are no longer open and you can't get it. Our lives are unfolding like riding on water in that it's dissipating as fast as it happens. By the time we notice what is even happening, everything that we perceive is already history. Everything, it's already, that's a scientific fact. And, <coughs> and it's dissipating just as fast as, it's, it, as things appear. And to uh, assign direct causation for that is silly because it's the it's the whole movie that makes up your your story, not some kind of individuated narrator in your head bump. So <coughs> that's contrivance. And, but life can live without so much head bone noise and it's quite simple and graceful and free and religions don't own it and philosophies don't own it and there's no school of thought that owns it it's natural it's just what it is it's just it's as natural as sunshine and uh, uh i personally i find it hard to really be present and entertain an eye thought and its contrivance at the same time. I just find it difficult. I've got to, I've got to almost come out of presence and, and, and start to conjure something made up of some pretty limited information. Uh, I find that most, most things happen. They happen mysteriously and the less I interfere with what wants to happen, it's, it turns out better than what I might contrive. So I, I, uh, my wife, Carol, has taught me to notice. I call her Notice Ananda. She notices everything. <coughs> when, when we're really here, when we're really present, we notice things, and those things that we notice of the whole is the whole universe working with us and we notice that and the more we notice it the more we relax that idea of direct causation and and accept the universe as it's as it's unfolding without needing some sort of conclusion trying to figure out universe is trying to figure out dreamless sleep can't be done. I call it a mountain of common sense, the same mountain that I call, call Robert. I've I read all about it and know, been backstage. Robert is, is 
uh, as clear a, a, a window a, as Ramana Maharshi ever was, except R Robert's here now and speaking and, and the universe is speaking, is happening through Robert right now and there's not a lot going on under that slab of concrete. Uh, the last time I was there, and the people were saying, oh, how great the mountain is. The mountain is God and all of this stuff. And I, I asked a simple question that left the phone founded. I said, would you show me where the mountain starts and stops? How far down does the magic go and how far <laughs> up does the magic go? And it's all seamless. That's just, that's just a belief. Now, if someone thinks they're going to be quiet when they go to the mountain, they might be quiet. Like somebody touching Jesus' robe and says, I'm healed, you healed me. And Jesus is saying, I didn't heal you. It was your own faith. So <clears throat> I think all that mess over there is, is a bunch of, of fundamentalist bullshit. And, uh, and and people are are making an ordinary human being into another idol, and it serves no one. Yeah, and I have tremendous respect for Ramon. Tremendous respect. I know, and, and I I respect his intention of being an ordinary human being. It's not really about lack of respect. I think when someone talks about Ramana Maharshi in the way that you do or I do, which is to humanize the person, you're actually showing him great respect. You're saying you were an ordinary human being and you did really great with that. I think that's, uh, for me, it's a statement of respect. Okay, so I want to, uh, to, uh, change course here a little and uh, open this up to the entire cast of disreputable characters I see on my screen. <laughs> a lot of them. If there's, uh, if there's any comments or questions, we just try to stay in the here and now as much as we can. Uh, thanks. Uh, I appreciate it, uh, Robert. Uh, um, um, from Yeah, yeah. I think um, I've, I've, I, I really read your book in, with a lot of interest um, coming from a religious spiritual background that, 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 that is kind of um, weighing a lot on, on my current situation right now. But anyways, I digress. Um, I've, I've seen a, a um, uh, a sense from your book that's really interesting. It's like just be yourself as best you can, moment, moment by moment, and then see where you are. That's as real as it gets. Uh, um, that really just that just resonates, you know, um, because um, it's like people try to make things that are more complicated than is than they really are. Um, 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 and I just find this this simplicity of everything that you have to say in your book just so refreshing, you know, coming from from a more complicated spiritual religious kind of point of view. So that's what really uh, refreshing, just to let things flow, kind of. Um, um, so I appreciate it, you know. It's it's nice, really nice. Thank you for saying that, Jorge. It's a pleasure to hear it. Mm -hmm. sure. um, yeah, I, I, there, I mean, you can see all of this in a religious way quite easily. It, it doesn't mean erasing religion. It's just understanding that we don't really know anything. So that our religion is maybe important to us in one way or another, culturally, or, or uh, gives you a place to go and, and uh, meet people, whatever the need. Um, but that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't have anything to do with the way the universe is really organized. In fact, to believe in those religious things, you have to deny a lot that we really know. 
or that we have very good reason to uh, believe. We have better reason to believe some of the things that science is telling us than we do to believe the things that religion is telling us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in order to get the kind of freedom that you're talking about that just feels so good, it's important to realize that you aren't disrespecting religion when you just say to it, these are your beliefs and you have them, and I respect that. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they, may be, they may be completely um, non-factual. It may be a, a myth. It could be mythological, like the ancient Greeks believed that Zeus was controlling everything from Mount Olympus. And they really believed it. A lot of them did. And now, to us now, we call that mythology, and we consider it, you know, um, comical kind of yeah well i think that the christian mythology is actually not as interesting to me as greek mythology. i see them both as forms of mythology but the, right but the the islamo christian um judeo mythology is not nearly as interesting to me as as uh, greek mythology because the characters in Greek mythology had these really human attributes. They were like us, only they were porn stars and such, you know. But they, they all looked perfect and they did whatever the hell they wanted to do in ordinary life, you know. They weren't hung up. But other than that, they were just like us. Hmm. Interesting. So I think we are those gods and goddesses if we want to look at it religiously this is our shot i mean that's all you get right so for me the freedom part is not in religion or no religion that has nothing to do with it really it's just understanding oh, okay. that in each moment as you were saying you can only deal with what you can deal with, and that's all you can deal with, and that's all you have to deal with. That's the whole, that's what I call being awake. And right. I'm so glad that a book that I wrote could communicate that to you in a way that, that you found helpful. Thank you so much for saying that. One thing that I appreciate about your book, Robert, is that you don't describe a scenario to be expected when the props are removed. Uh, Ramana Maharshi did the same thing. That's for one to see for oneself and to take one to the a point to see then the talking can stop. And what you see is what you get. And to contaminate that with an expectation of, of, of uh, these, some sort of goal or enlightenment, et cetera, via an experience or something like that is really misleading. And Robert does not, in his book, does not mislead. He simply takes you there to see for yourself. And that's critical to see for yourself. That's true self-inquiry. Be left open and awake without someone else's contrivance trying to tell you what you're seeing. And I, I super appreciate that. I love that. When, when, when Robert takes the pacifier out of your mouth, he doesn't give you another one. Oh, thank you so much for saying that, John. <laughs> That's great. I love that. That's what it comes down to. And take the pacifier out, and then you're just here. And there's nowhere else you can get to. This is it. 
which everyone hears those words repeatedly. And I guess I'm just repeating them. It's nothing original with me. Your book covers a lot of a lot of areas in that way because it always resolves to here and now. And of course, on your with the thing with Rich Archer, you just said, which was simply, "What about now?" And that's so hard because no one just really wants to be here right now. They always want to be either someplace they were or someplace they want to be. Mm -hmm. They're never satisfied with the present moment. It's and the thing that I also realized, go ahead. I just wanted to comment on that. They don't want to be here because now is where all the pain is. <laughs> Which is self-inflicted. <laughs> well, be that as it may, self-inflicted or inflicted by the gods. <laughs> Zeus? doesn't really matter. See, all that's, that's the chit-chat. Nobody really has, knows anything about all that, where it's all coming from, where it's all headed. It's above our pay grade, I'm afraid. <laughs> it seems that some people have a subscription to pain in the present, and that if they let go of the idea that they are bound by that, they wouldn't have to look in the past or the future. Just being there, there can't really be pain if you're really there. Or if there is pain, then you can accept it. I had pain when they replaced my shoulder. It hurt like hell. Yeah, because they rebalanced your shoulder. Well, they cut through nerves and bone and sawed and drilled holes down my bone and everything else. And it hurt like, hurt like you couldn't believe. Sure. It wasn't a mental, it wasn't just a, a mental. I was doing to myself. Pain is pain, it's real. But that was about balance. It was to rebalance the... Well, forgive me, David, what John, I, what I understood you to be saying, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is of course pain exists. You know, only a fool would deny that. That's what I heard. Is that what you were saying? Yes, that, that's correct. Pain, pain is pain. Uh, the, whether it's balanced or you deserve it or it's the other side of this, a karma, none of that matters to me. When something hurts, it just hurts. And, and then you manage it with with what's at hand. Oh, okay. And, and the older you get, the more pain. In yes. my case. That's well. That's what the, <laughs> that's what the Buddha taught. Old, I don't avoid old age, illness, and death. The Buddha called it old age, illness, and death. So I I accept that. I know you do. So. Yes. Robert. I don't know if you hear if you hear me. I see you. Hi. Paloma. Paloma. You see me? You hear? Yep. Hola, que tal? Hola, Paloma. <laughs> <laughs> um I I have a question actually. And um we're talking about pain and um, I guess more like physical pain. But um, in, in, in the, what I wanted to ask you, Robert, and I think I've done it before at some point in different ways, um, but again, I stumble upon the same thing to do with, you know, suffering, uh, emotional suffering, not only, well, the one that you could say is provoked also when I see people who I love suffering. Um, so my question is from the point of view of presence or whatever you want to um, call it, how, how do we deal with, with that, with um, emotional suffering 
or despondence, um, powerlessness, and, or even um, fear of the future. I mean, those really strong emotions, how do we deal with them now? Thank you. Hi, Paloma. That's what a great question. I don't really think there's a how. I think that sooner or later, one is going to see that there's no alternative to what you feel. You just feel what you feel. There's nobody making any of that and no one's in control of it. That's just the way it is in this moment. I think that's about as far as, as um, I can go with, with um, replying to your question. Although I know that traditionally that question is answered by giving you a practice like if you find yourself getting upset, breathe deeply. Okay, I guess you know that. But beyond that, sit quietly, breathe deeply, and try to and try to collect yourself. Beyond that, someone just entered the set. Who's that? Chris Kirsten. Yeah, sorry, that was loud. No, it's not a problem. How are you, Kirsten? I'm good, thank you. Sorry I'm late. Well, you're not late. Here you are. So to go back to, <laughs> to, go back to Paloma's question, go back to Paloma's question. What you feel is not a choice. It's the only now there is. As it arises, it's passing away again. This is a flow and your feelings are always in flux. Someone who knows that all of this is just passing, that we're here for our brief moment, we do our little dance and then we pass away again. Um, these things may really seem much less serious. We, we kind of have this, um, we bounce the ball of suffering, as it were, um, through rebellion. Um, kind of, okay, we are feeling really this very strong emotion. Um, and we, we create an even stronger one, which could be anger or, um, uh, yeah, rebellion. So we, we, in a way, we, we deal with it. So um, I don't really know whether or not it makes it worse, actually. Sometimes I'm sure it makes it, um, we don't feel as bad because we feel that we are actually fighting it and we have a chance. But, um, but yeah, so what I'm saying is um, we are going to do something about it. Um, and in hindsight, of course, you could say, well, fighting it, having this very rebellious attitude towards it, um, um, wrecking your head, trying to find a solution, the right thoughts to come out of the problem you're having right now, how to help someone who's refusing um, help or action um, to deal with their um, own emotional um, suffering. Well, that might not be a very good idea um, on, you know, in the long term. So what, um, what would be the difference between um, staying with the suffering as we, or as you said, um, dealing with it in the now, what's the difference between that and um, fighting it, fighting back with, with other emotions which are probably just a way of um, uh, distraction, distracting your mind from what you're feeling at that point. Okay. What, what do you, what do you Well, er, earlier, I don't 
don't know if you were here for that. Oz talked about, I think it was Oz, talked about um, strategy arriving in a situation like this, like this group, with a strategy that something, that you were going to get something from it. Um, and you're talking about the other side of it now. As I understood it, this isn't really about you. This is about someone else in your, in your life, someone you care about. Is that right? Paloma? I, I feel, yes. Can you hear me? I, I feel it's always a bit easier for me to deal with my own <laughs> problems um, or, or, or pain. I feel more equipped than you know, when I see someone around me suffering, which of course, in the end, it's me who feels bad about it. So those are my own emotions too. Well, that's it. You just said it. Actually, what more do you need? You have no choice. It's your shit. There's not a how, but there's an approach, which is you don't take responsibility because you didn't cause this. But this is the hand that you've got to play. Not that you deserve to get this hand, God was punishing you or some, some story like that. But this is the way the cookie crumbled. You're sitting there with these feelings and these feelings towards other people. And it's yours. It doesn't belong to the other people. They only exist in your imagination. I don't mean this the way a solipsist would. A solipsist is someone who believes that nothing exists except me. I don't mean that. Without, without psychoanalyzing anything or making a how to fix it out of any of this, prior to that, the trick if there is a trick, I hesitate to call this a trick, is just to understand that what you're seeing is you. You're the only one who's seeing it. It's taking, all of these dramas are taking place. I don't mean the shit that's happening at work or whatever to your friend. All that may really be happening in its way. But the part that troubles you is not the events. The part that troubles you is your emotions. And it's hard to deal with them. And that's it. That's what you have to deal with. That's the job. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say about you know, compassion, which is something that's been talked about a lot, that, OK. Um, you see someone close to you suffering and somehow if you exercise uh, compassion um, it's a kind of like catharsis <laughs> because sometimes you can't do anything about them uh, suffering and going through a, a tough time. Well earlier on a couple of minutes ago, a few minutes ago you mentioned compassion and then you, at that point you were questioning whether that's helpful or unhelpful. Do you remember that? This was a few minutes ago. What we call compassion may, may feel good but it may be entirely misguided. The donkey. I don't know if you can hear that. My donkeys know I'm up here. And, uh, I I hear them, I hear them. <laughs> <laughs> They're outside. <laughs> they want me. <laughs> so what, what I'm saying is, you know, there's compassion is another one of those words. It's good. You know, everybody wants to be compassionate. Nobody wants to lack compassion. But compassion without, without, um, 
wisdom <laughs> might be might do more harm than good. You know, like say you came upon an accident victim lying in the <clears throat> highway. Out of compassion, you might run over and pick this person up and try to put him in, in the back seat of your car and take him to the hospital. That would be compassionate, but it would be ignorant and stupid because what you need to do is let the person lie right there until the, the experts who know how to handle injured people show up. So there's that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. It's a concrete example. You can be a bleeding heart and you can go through this world caring about other people's feelings and all of that. Yes, it might be helpful to someone at a, at a certain time, and it might be very unhelpful to someone at another time, or it might depend on how you feel when you're being compassionate, which is like a, you're already doing something. See, what, what I'm trying to say, Paloma, is whatever you feel right now is yours. It doesn't belong to anyone else. You're the only one who's witnessing it. You're totally alone. Totally alone. You may wish through the bridge of compassion to actually crack through that and not be totally alone. I don't think that's feasible. I think that ultimately, since you asked me how to deal with this, and I'm taking you very seriously, I think you have to realize that if you don't deal with it, nobody else is going to. No one can. So your compassion needs to be, in my opinion, self-compassion first. Above all, self-compassion, by which I mean you see yourself in your human wounded, woundedness. And you understand that the idea of transcending all that is a kind of fantasy. And that there's no transcending because it's always now. And so whatever you feel now is only here for this brief instant and you have to deal with it. In the next instant, there's a new now you have to deal with. You only have to do it bit by bit, moment by moment. You have to chew up your life bite by bite and swallow it. And sometimes you have barely enough saliva to get it down. I don't know if that illuminates your, your, your question or not. I hope so. Yeah, when you see someone suffering and um, it, is a, it keeps on happening and you are there and, um, you know, as you're saying, it's bit by bit, moment by moment. And um, yeah, it, um, it resonates. <laughs> so thank you. There are these de details, and of course, they have to do with love. Um, that's what's driving us, wanting love and wanting to give love and, and receive love is very human in the very deepest way. I don't think it goes much deeper. And so that's clearly going to be the material, or at least part of it, in a thinking life, I, would, I suppose. We have to ask ourselves these questions constantly. But what I'm saying is, but what it really boils down to is that you fly like a Paloma. <laughs> and, and yes, and you know, you live for yourself. That's when you can be compassionate and loving. But love is when you have something to give after all. And what you have to give is yourself. Not 
you have to be all torn up because this person's going through bad times. That may be something you have to deal with, but that's not the actual love. The actual love is that even though this person's having a hard time, he or she is still okay with you. That's the love. I don't know if I'm making this clear. It's not your, it's not your identification with this person's suffering that, that's really the loving part. The loving part is that you accept this suffering person as an important person. That's the, that's the loving. This is just my view, my perspective on it. I don't know if you agree with that. I'm no expert. In matters of the heart, I am no expert. I am not. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm, I think I'm catching on to uh, hosting the meeting and being at the meeting. <laughs> so that, after the last one with Paloma, I did have a question. Uh, I, I had a, a recent uh, episode with uh, I'm an aging mother who has dementia um, uh, had, has recently disowned me uh, and it's very painful and, and I'm struggling. Um, there's a part of me that wants to transcend this, this pain I feel, um, but it's there. Uh, and having <coughs> sat around in non-dual circles for many years, uh, I find this, uh, struggle between wanting, you know, the mind wanting to transcend and not feel the pain, uh, but the pain's there and um, hearing what you just told Paloma, I uh, was thinking, okay, here it is, and dealing with it, and yet there's part of my uh, thinking that goes, um, feeling like I, I the fact that I'm feeling this great pain and, and struggling with, with uh, it's bringing up a lot of early childhood shit, honestly. Uh, I'm just kind of struggling on how to get through this or if I even should get through it. Maybe it's just a day by day thing. That's my question. Yeah, that's a really good question, of course, it really is. Um, you mentioned non-duality and you see yeah. that there's a misconception entirely on that subject that's um, hanging a lot of us up and I think that's what you're referring to. Um, I think there's this idea that non-duality is supposed to be a, a method of transcendence. Right. Yeah, so if you could just get non-duality, so this version goes. Yeah. You wouldn't feel, you wouldn't feel the, this intense pain on dealing with your, your, your mother's um, dementia and all, right. all that that entails. Right. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, it's a misunderstanding of non-duality, that's all. Just a misunderstanding. Okay. The, it, no one can speak from a non-dual perspective, okay? Nobody can, but I'm just going to do my best. But this is just um, jargon, but it's expressing something that I want to say about non-duality. And it's this. If suffering is there, you can't just pick it up and throw it away. This is non-duality, it's just one universe. So you, you can't just throw it away. Where are you gonna put it? Mm -hmm. This is it. This is part of it. That's what the Buddha taught, old age, illness, and death. That's our birthright. And until we accept that in ourselves and the people we love, 
we won't just feel the pain, which is an obvious part of this, but we'll also feel this uh, rupture between what we think and what we feel, which is what I hear you struggling with. And my advice to you is forget what you think and go with the feelings. You know, I have noticed, um, in, this has been going on for about a month, the, and you talked about it with Paloma, that, you know, at times the pain is there and, and it's there, and at other times it's not, and it's beautiful, um, and there's great compassion, and, and it seems to kind of flow between these two, and, and there's this desire to say, oh, why can't I stay with this beautiful compassion, and then the pain comes back, and... Yes, but see, this is what this is what you really have to solve vis-a-vis -vis your own demise, your old, your own old age illness and death. That's a, this is a this is a this is like a lock, and each one of us needs to find our own key and put it in this lock and turn it, mm. so that in your final moments you can have this acceptance and compassion towards your dying self. That's uh -huh. what we're all really yearning for. You you understand me? Yes. So yeah. this situation with your mom is how you get that key. You have to deal with this. Uh, it, like a gift, I guess, huh? Yes, it's a gift. It's yeah. a gift that you love someone enough to give a fuck. Yeah. It's already a big gift. Yeah, yeah. Huge. Gigantic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right. This is this is actually a, I'm, I'm now I blew myself to tears here. But uh, this is a very sad and cruel world from a lot of aspects. So the kind of suffering that comes from actually caring about someone else, I think you've got you know when they opened the the can of suffering, they gave you the cream from the top and left all the dregs to the other people. Mm. Yes? You get it? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm not yeah. just kidding. <laughs> I'm crying. No, no, you're good. All right. Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, Robert. Hello, who's that? Donna. Hi, Donna. Um, what about when the opposite happens, when there is no compassion? And uh, for, for myself, I had years of that, but the people that I was connected to, uh, starting from childhood, whenever I would reach out to love or feel <coughs> connection to them or compassion, I got my hands in that and pushed away. <laughs> So I don't, I, can't, I think I've shut down and I've been praying to feel compassion for others again because it's, it's I don't feel it. And, uh, you know, I don't like it. I don't like that I don't feel compassion for myself or for others. I don't like that I don't like myself. Um, I don't like the way the world's treating me. I, and so I've, I've, and I had these beautiful spiritual experiences and, and they made me feel compassion and they made me want to love and connect. And it's just like, everything's gone and everybody's pushing me away and I'm pushing them away. So the opposite's happening, this lack of compassion and connectedness. So it almost makes me feel like I'm neurotic or something. You want me to come there? Oh, yeah, definitely. Because I, it's See, I think in general, this isn't just about you, but in general, I think we really need to avoid framing ourselves, making these frames like you just framed yourself as neurotic. I wouldn't I call it that. I, don't, I wouldn't call it neurotic. And in fact, calling it that becomes a real impediment. I think... Um, you need psychotherapy probably it would be the best approach, not spirituality at this point. So, I have to agree with you with that because the, the episodes over the last probably 15 years 
have progressed with this um, either me pushing them away or me being pushed away and people shutting off and leaving and just there's just been so much um, loss in so many ways and uh, and then when I got sick with the fibromyalgia the last three years I couldn't even get out of bed and my friends and family were dropping away and, and angry with me because I'm sick. Oh, okay, well, what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here, Donna, is that I don't think this is really the place where you can get what you need in terms of, I mean, there's nothing I can say at this point. It's, you need to talk to someone about this for a sustained time because there are many details. I think we require at least a few hours. So what I'm saying is we shouldn't really be discussing these feelings here. You need to be in a, in a more supportive, sustained situation and then talk to someone about these feelings. Because see, I, if we started talking about it here, it would become personal very quickly. And I don't want to do that here. Yeah, I I'm just doing the best I can with everyone, Donna. So, sure. it's, you know. Well, would you be willing to talk on the side? at all or do you have time do what do you have time to talk on the side off off of this uh, I really, no don i really can't take that on i'm retired from doing psychotherapy and right. what i'm doing now is not psychotherapy it has nothing to do with it nothing i'm not respecting anyone's feelings see psychotherapy is about the therapist takes your feelings into account that's what's being dealt with and studied that's where all the pain is your feelings, but I don't actually care about your feelings. In, in this milieu, I'm, what I'm doing here is talking about a certain understanding. That's what the 10,000 Things book is about. It's about an understanding of what I am and what I am not. But that isn't your question right now. Your right. questions are about feeling cut off. So this is not the appropriate venue. See what I mean? I do. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I wish you well. This is not to dismiss your feelings. I hope you understand that. But they need to be dealt with in another, in, in a, a much better arena. This isn't the place. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so who, who hasn't had a chance to speak and wants to, or is, wants another chance, if you have? Hello, Gonzalo. You never say anything. Hello, Robert, and all of you. I, I am very grateful to be with you, all of you. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, not my situation every day here <clears throat> to be able to relate to intelligent, intelligent people <laughs> <clears throat> or mature people. And uh, for sure, uh, for a long time, I, I, I was on, on my spiritual path. Uh, if I might call that, you know, reading books. Uh, doing some practices. I was uh, for some years in a same Buddhist uh, place uh, with a teacher who told me how to sit uh, down in silence uh, looking at the wall. And, and then I came to Advaita and I had my, what I thought was my guru, uh, Ramesh Balsekar, I went to visit him in India. I had my share of that also. And after I came to Costa Rica, it was 2008, something like that, I became a, a, a kind of person who wanted to, to give uh, people the chance to understand what I thought it was important about non-duality. So I became a facilitator of uh, uh, retreats here in Costa Rica, bringing different uh, teachers, non-dual teachers. And by by talking to you, by dialoguing with you, by reading you, uh, Lord, I, 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 I got to the point to understand that uh, what, I am, what I understand now, that uh, any looking for, for something else than now is unnecessary. It's not only unnecessary, it's uh, damaging. Uh, damaging to, to, to what, what we live now, I mean, to the present moment. And so, it is not so difficult as I thought uh, in the beginning when I was in the search of uh, 
in the spiritual stretch because I, I was looking for something very extraordinary. Like I totally I wanted to be like Ramana Maharshi or Padgata Maharaj. And that was my <clears throat> my my search for not to be a, 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 a natural man, I mean like a, anyone else, I mean the man. But no, I was looking for something special to get out of all the confusion, to get out of all my uh, uh, all my problems, all my sufferings, you know. That was my path. And I am very thankful, not only to the book, because I, before the book, uh, I must tell the truth, I haven't read the, the whole book. I read some parts of the book and I find uh, in what I read, what I already talked with, with, with you, Robert, and uh, in, in the dialogues or uh, in the in Facebook. And so that's what I have to say. Like, uh, I, 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 I enjoy listening to people here because uh, it's not a it's not only a confirmation of what I uh, think, feel now, but it's more like uh, sharing something that seems that is really natural, simple, but it seems out of the reach of uh, the majority of people for whatever reason. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't go into that, but that sometimes I try to, to tell people to to read your book, to listen to you, uh, here in Costa Rica at least, because there is a group that is a non-dual group that are always, you know, bringing teachers, they're having uh, retreats, and uh, but nobody cares much about it, but I cannot do nothing else than just uh, enjoy uh, your 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 uh, writings, enjoy your uh, these meetings, and that's it, what can I do? But thank you very much for, I appreciate very much uh, everything that you have uh, done. Uh, thank, thank you so much for that. Very kind of you, Gonzalo. I wonder if there's any, um, yeah, I'll comment on that. I, this is so great um, that we can do this. You're in, you're in Costa Rica. I'm here in Mexico. We have people in Switzerland, right? Sterling, that's what it is, Switzerland. Yes, Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> You're very fortunate to have us here from the Alps. Uh, we may not be here next week. Uh, Donald Trump is coming, and we're we're all going into the bunkers. With questions. I just want to thank. Robert, I just wanted to say something. It's Beth Richards um, that might, I don't know, help a few of the people that are dealing with some tough things. Um, I, I have to say that one of the greatest gifts of the book for me is breaking the back of a kind of addiction to success that I just see everywhere around me that's really affected me in my life. This, this drive for accomplishment, whether it's success in attaining enlightenment or getting a book published or you have raising a, a successful kids, which is one of the worst traps imaginable, or um, simply being uh, admired in society or feeling accomplished. And all of these, this addiction to success seems to permeate this so-called spiritual realm so much that when people have bad shit happen to them, bad luck, and it can be a long run of bad luck, they feel like they're somehow responsible, they feel guilty, they feel bad, and anyway, your book really helped me break the back of all that, which for me, it doesn't sound like a lofty um, kind of experience, but it's been so fundamental to me, and I'm, I'm still... Um, digesting that it, it sort of really takes me back to that quote by Walter about taking life a bite at a time and sometimes you barely have enough saliva to get that bite down but that to me is probably the biggest thing I've taken away from your book well thank you am I on yes thank you thank you for that Death. Uh, I was really so fortunate to um, run across Walter Chappelle in my life. He was, he was uh, 
really want to teach her. And that was one of the best things he ever said to me. Have to chew up your life bite by bite and swallow it. And sometimes you have barely enough saliva to get it down. And I like that because it just puts the ball in your court. You have, you're the one who has to do the swallowing. No one else can do it for you. Well, I think also when, when you let go, Robert, that, that was what I was trying to communicate. I probably didn't do a great job. But when you let go of all the expectations around and the guilt around, I don't have this privileged life. I'm not, or, or whatever the story is you're living, that all that guilt and all that sense of um, I'm not, I'm not living up to whatever expectations society or yourself puts on it to just that's so much a part of just being present I'm finding and it seems so simplistic but for some reason I don't know for some reason 10,000 things really hit it home for me um, I'm really glad to hear that beautiful I think there's something about that book that really is mind expanding. Um, if I go back and read a chapter, it expands my mind and, and I wrote it. I mean, there, it, and I think what it is, is there's now looking back on it, there's this forgiveness, self forgiveness theme that just runs through this thing through all the chapters. So even though the book itself may appear to be discouraging in the sense that it's telling you there's not this great thing to find that's going to put you out of your misery for now and for good all, it does say that, which may seem discouraging, but it, it also shows this other sense of self that, well, I've lost the thread on that. You're absolutely right, though, Robert. You did hit it on the nail. It's forgiveness. You, 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 you named it for me. Thank you. Yes. I forgive myself for having had shitty luck. You know, I forgive myself and, I, and that compassion. Wow, that is such a huge piece to being present. You know? um, when to the extent that you see that no one is choosing this. There is no chooser separate from one's, the one, the myself that thinks it's going to do choosing. That, that, that is choosing. It's part of it. Most of it happens unconsciously. And it gets mixed all together in a big pot moment by moment and out comes our feelings and our um, Doubts and fears and aspirations and hopes are all centered around whatever this agenda item is. You know, either getting it if we desire it or getting some distance from it if we, we fear it. This is an automatic. And the idea of the fixed person is projected onto all that awareness by societal inculcation. It's a really very simple matter, and there's no guilt or blame because it's been done to all of us. We have that in common. We human beings have that in common. We've all had culture imposed upon our native beingness, whatever, whatever that means to you. Um, our sexuality, our, our vitality as, as human beings, all of this that drives us to to be human, that's been tamed, that's been put into a, a waterway instead of just running loose and free. And last, last Zoom meeting, I got into the psychology of the situation a little. Um, this is what these great theorists, Jung and, and Freud, and to a lesser extent, Adler, were um, trying to understand. How can it be that we're so wild in our dreams or in our imagination or in our fantasies 
And yet the way we live is so constrained, see? Like a guy will be walking down the street undressing women routinely with, you know, in his imagination. It's just a routine pastime for a lot of guys, normal. And um, that's, his, that's the actual id. But meanwhile, he's living this straight-laced life, and it's like chafing, see? This is the, and then that, that's called a lack of, of freedom. We're, we're not choosing to have the sex hang-ups we have. We just have them, or whatever the case may be. I, was, I talk about sexuality because it's very primal, but we, we have other drives. And we can, um, they have, our drives have been harnessed by forces not of our choosing, put it that way. So we don't have any control over that. Robert was made to be like Robert after this set of genetic endowments arrives in the Saltzman family. And right immediately, the good, the bad, and the ugly all happen. <laughs> That's just, and we, we, turn <laughs> we turn out being this myself, you see, that has all these problems that we've been discussing. And it's not that I don't have those problems. I wish I could make that clear. I have the same problems that we all have. What I have that some people seem to have forgotten is a perspective on it that sees objectively that which is pure subjectivity. No one can help. This is what John Troy was getting at earlier. No one, this is changing from, it's gone before you even notice it. It, it, that's what John was talking about, that by the time you know of some decision, it's the dis deciding already took place. You're just becoming consciously informed of it. And as we become consciously informed of our decisions, at the same moment we construct the, the explanation for them, or the rationale through which we made such and such a decision. Meanwhile, the decision has already taken place prior to any of that. So this is, this is an ongoing story of agency that I say, and you can laugh at me, you can, whatever. I say that's what I mean by awake. When you see that sense of agency, and that's not you. You see it, it exists, but you don't inhabit it, not, not even with a single breath. It's just hanging there like a ghost in the closet. Because in your being, in your being, that doesn't really exist. It really doesn't. And this is not, I'm so glad you're here, John Troy, because you, this is what you were talking about before. This feeling this way does not mean that Robert Saltzman doesn't feel any pain. I may feel pain in ways that people who don't have this understanding don't feel it. For all I know, I can't compare. I have no, no basis for comparison. I just know what I know. But to see with open eyes is not to remove all the pain from your life. And it's not to be perpetually happy either. It's to be sane and calm in your own armchair, when you don't have any problems, when you're not driving in traffic, when no one is screaming in your ear, when you're not at work with a bitch boss or whatever it is, you're just sitting there at home, like I am here, this is my, my life takes place here, this is my studio. Um, I'm just sitting here, and he, we're all here together, and I find myself continually, continually able to manifest this sense of just enjoyment at the very being. It won't always be here. I posted this thing this morning from uh, Cold Mountain. I don't, 
where is that? I don't know if you know this book. Um, this is one translation. I've been told it's not the best, but I don't have the other one. I'm going to read this, though. This is the one I posted. The peach blossoms would like to stay through the summer, hear a donkey. The peach blossoms would like to stay through the summer, but winds and moons hurry them on and will not wait. Though you look for the men of the Han dynasty, not a one will you find alive. Morning after morning, flowers fade and fall. Year after year, men pass away. Here where the dust whirls up today, in times gone by, was a sprawling sea. Now, I don't know about you. I can't account for you. But when I understand that this is a uh, fact, <laughs> it really sets me free. I mean, what more do you need to hear? This is all passing away as it arises. It's totally disposable. This is your movie, as, as they say. This is it. And it doesn't repeat. It's one time through the projector and into the Akashic records. <laughs> <laughs> there really aren't any. That's the funny part. It's all disappearing. It's total impermanence. And writing on water. Yes. So it see impermanence is I got this, I got this um, private message today. I don't and I replied, I don't I don't know if I posted it on Facebook or not, about the fear of impermanence, that the fear is the fear is of impermanence, I should say. And for me, impermanence is the greatest. It's, the, it's what we really have going for us. This suffering doesn't have to last forever. Nice. We, 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 can, just be, we can just be here and inhabit this and feel what it is even if it's bad pain, like Shimmer, I don't think he's here anymore. He's got, he had cancer. He's, I think, okay now, um, clear anyway. But he suffered a tremendous amount of pain for a long time. And here he is. I think that's what life is. And I think that's what was taught, the original teaching. All life is suffering. And there's, see, then the other teachings are, there's a way out of this suffering. Well, that's true, but it doesn't mean that you don't suffer. It's a way out of this suffering. And it's into a more intentional suffering, or a more intentional is not the right word, but it's the, it's the jargon that I learned as a, as a Gurdjieff person. Um, you just realize that what's being played out is inevitable. It's inevitable that you, it's inevitable that we all be here today. Not that it's preordained, that's not my point, but it's inevitable because here we are. I don't know what brings this all together as a happening. I have no, no overarching viewpoint of any of it. We just all have our own uh, motives and our own desires and our own feelings. And here we are doing this group. That's much bigger than myself. It's a, I'm not the, the doer. I'm the speaker at the moment. J. Krishnamurti, the speaker. <laughs> sir, is it all right? <laughs> is it all right, sir? But so, and, and he, he mocked himself in the same way that I'm kind of doing now. A little self, self deprecation is helpful when you're the speaker. But so, 
that's what it boils down to. It's just a happening. It's a dance. Comments, please, from someone. What about you, Julio? What do you got? Nothing, nothing from Barcelona. Wait, your mic is off. You hear him? Anybody hear him? I don't hear him. I hear you. Okay. I see you. Okay. I see you. Yeah, he's telling telling us he can't can't be heard. He's 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 not muted. I can see that on my on my host screen. (laughs) Yeah, this has kind of been a tech challenge. I think I'm hanging in there. It's a lot of a lot of people. How about you, Sharon? Any comments? I, I, I don't really have a comment. I've, and I've got a crazy kitten just jumping all over me at the moment. Um, I did write um, to you earlier in the week, um, but I didn't. I didn't really have an actual question. I think I was just more in agreement with with things that you'd already said and, you know, just expressing that, you know, about um, the the non-duality. Oh, I don't hear anything. I I had my mic on mute. Where are you located in the world, Sharon? I'm in Scotland. Wow. Place I've never seen, and I've always had this curiosity about Scotland. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's one of those places. Why? I've nothing nothing really to add, rather than... Well, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy that you're here. I, I, you're on. You're on the screen here, and you look quite relaxed yeah. and happy. You're lit perfectly. It's, it's a cinematographer's dream. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> any, any, anything else going on here? Hello, Robert. It's Paul. Hello, Paul. How are you? Doing all right? Uh, huh? I say I'm doing okay. Not bad. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Um, I just wanted to say how helpful it was with your comments about um, there's no no doer. And uh, having a sense of knowing that um, has been quite helpful for me for some time in daily working life. Um, so yeah, yeah. It seems to it seems to move. There doesn't seem to be a, a separation from private time to working time, and uh, so it just seems that there's this feeling that I I have an understanding of of just how thoughts arise of their own accord, of their own volition. And um, yeah, I seem to be fine with that. And in working life, you know, if problems are coming up or perceived problems, it's it's kind of just a happening, and I just deal with it in a sort of a sort of a stimulus response fashion, which is kind of out of my hands. But I'm just dealing with things as they happen in the moment. So I guess that's just a comment on um, how helpful it's been from your book. Uh, it's been one of the big uh, understandings for me about. Um, just seeing how things just arise, I suppose, and uh, in their own way, and just dealing with things in in that moment. So I guess that's my my comment there. Well, I, I like what you had to say about um, the way that um, work life and and private life just um, became all of a piece. 
I think that's really a good description of a certain feeling that occurs when you actually see that wherever you go and whatever is occurring, there you are. And that you is not a permanent presence. It's the you that arises under each circumstance. I think you got that idea from uh, Forti, as I am, as I have understood our our online conversation and a bit of private. Um, and so now, having seen that experience, is is the grist for the mill. That's that's what life is. Life is experience. Um, uh, it it just it just is before we have any ideas about it. Winston Churchill was asked about history, and he said, "Oh, history, that's just one damn thing after another." And that's what I'm saying, precisely. Can I jump in here for a minute? Just to ask you about uh, your, to go back to the start with uh, the 10,000 things, the very first thing in your book, it says, to study the self is to forget the self. Uh, to forget the self is to be enlightened by the 10,000 things. And I'm just wondering, I've looked at lots of different translations and I've just wanted to know in, in simple terms what your, your reasoning for putting that in and what your your take on that, that uh, those two lines are to study the self is to forget the self let's take that line the self is what's hanging everyone up I me mine as the Beatles put it uh, you know, myself my my, my actions, my behavior, my hang-ups, my needs, my fears, all of this is like a, a jumble in the mind. And by studying the self, that's what we're doing here. We're untangling this jumble by looking at what really is myself and what isn't or even if such a question is relevant, by putting all that on the table, instead of getting caught up in the minutia of this pain, we can get more of a feeling that we're all involved in this same process. It may take on different flavors, paths, or whatever you want to call them. No one will ever accuse me of being a bhakti, for example. You know. Uh, I'm the skeptic in the in the group, but whatever approach one takes, it's going to boil down to the same thing sooner or later. Just will, and that's inexpressible, and that's what can't be taught. And calling it a fixed self, which. I, I don't know enough about Ramana Maharshi to know if he did that or he didn't. I think the Sargadatta may have said that, but I'm not sure. Because according to um, Jean Dunn, who was actually the author of those books, not I Am That, but the subsequent ones, Seeds of Consciousness and all that, according to Jean Dunn, when he was asked, he said only one person had ever understood what he was talking about, and that was Maurice Friedman. And no one else, he said, had understood him. And he said it with bitterness, according to Gene Dunn. So here's this one guy, Maurice, who doesn't really do all that much talking about it. And then you have all these other people who claim to have been disciples or students of Nisargadatta, which really means that he didn't throw them out. They sat around his attic up there listening to him. In the same way that we're doing now, basically, it's one guy rapping about whatever. Um, and they, 
came out of that empowered to be teachers somehow and they and they and they brought this thing to the west but it was already in bad condition when they brought it because they hadn't understood it that's what i really think happened because when i look the more i look into what these people i i have criticized are really saying now that i've gotten past in my own mind the the, the need to criticize it um, and I've just decided I, I know I'm going to turn the criticism on the human credulity that takes one guy's rantings as truth. So that's that's the problem, not the ranting. The rantings were good, <laughs> as good as this one, if maybe not better. <laughs> so Nisargadatta, for example, was just talking about his experience. He really was. But it's not taken that way. And I think what I have tried to say in the 10,000 things, this is a long drawn out answer, is when you don't think there's this one thing, and I forget now what they called it, self, um, self-observation, but I forget the Ramana Maharshi, the Nisargadatta term for it, but, uh, searching for I am or whatever it is, if that becomes the thing, then you don't see the 10,000 things, which is this life. And when the 10,000 things inform us about the self, we are relaxed. It's what Zen poetry tries to be about or this nature painting that they do with bamboo and leaves, that, or some of my photography is along those lines. That, that it's this world itself that's be, the beauty, not some theory about it. It's this aliveness that's... It's, it's what, we, what we crave is, is to feel alive and connected up not to be spiritual that's a that's a, a cop-out kind of we, what we really want is to be hooked up robert i i think you and ramana are coming from the same place and that uh, your background and your vocabulary and your way of expressing, et cetera, is a little more in tune with today's mindset. But when Ramana came along, he woke up from a panic attack when he was a teenager. He didn't know any of this stuff. <clears throat> he had a panic attack, freaked out. And, and like a, a kid who had taken acid and in high school, he dropped out and, and, and went to Chirvana Malai uh, based on, he thought that's where, that was the home of God. And he, he went there and, he, and his, he said to himself, as he went there, that will be done. Or as Robert might say, it's just accept, accept the here and now. And <clears throat> he lived as a hermit. And then this fellow called Kavi Kantha came along, who was had uh, several hundred followers and was recognized to be a brilliant person in India and pointed Ramana Maharshi out. At the time, Ramana Maharshi didn't have a name. It was Kavi Kantha who named him, and it was Kavi Kantha who to him in Eastern mythology and superstitions and, and uh, Advaita Vedanta, all of that. He didn't know any of that prior. So it was his first audience was Kavya Kantha's old devotees who were now at his doorstep, at his cave. And so he responded with the language and the nomenclature that was woven into their culture at that time. 
and responded that way. He, he never had a guru. He never had a, a devotee. He, he didn't learn how to wait. It just happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I think he was a mountain of common sense. I think Robert is a mountain of common sense. And, and the, the more common sense, the better, in, in my opinion. And I think myth I'm with Robert on the mythologies, uh, you can take a mythology or a story like The Wizard of Oz and gain as much out of the essence of that story as you can out of any sacred text. It's all the same. It's just that the sacred guys want to own territory and brand it. I say Wizard of Oz better because you can easily let go of the story and still have the meaning resonate, the essence resonate. Making idols of all of these religious people and stories is counterproductive in really being here and now because you're taking a thread of that tapestry and exalting it above every other thread in the tapestry. And that's the antithesis of, of the real message here. But I see, I see no difference. If, if, if I think about Ramana Maharshi or I think about Robert, I feel it's like a perfect equal. I don't see in sentience, I don't see any lines or borders or containers or anything else. It, it's as seamless as a dream is seamless. So it's taboo to say you're an equal to Ramana Maharshi, but he certainly did teach that. But the God Squad won't let you say it without putting you down, not putting you up. The God Squad's come. They might gather around you, Robert. It could be some on this on this screen right now that are trying to gather around you. And this is what Robert means and everything. The cool thing is I couldn't <laughs> teach this or a fuck about all that. It means nothing to me. I have no ambitions in this field whatsoever. <laughs> so it's a, I'm entirely free. No one knows what that's worth. It's great. It's just great. I could say whatever I like and I do. And I could be raving. That's right. And I love that part of it. <laughs> right on. Right Rave on, on Robert. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's so, this is so beautiful, John. You know, there's so much to, there's so much simple understanding. There really is. It's very simple. It's not that complicated. That's why I like Walter. That chew it up and swallow it like one bite at a time. That's brilliant. That's just great. Yeah. It's not like we've got a choice. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. Someone says, well, Robert, you're looking pretty old and beat up. I say, well, what's the option? Hi, Katanya, I'll see you there. You could peek in. Well, who is your, it's over with now. Yeah. I'm home, honey. No, <laughs> no we're, we're on the air here. <laughs> oh, we're just, this is one of these loose meetings. Yeah. Um, it's been a great meeting. The first 25 minutes of it didn't get recorded. That's when I was raving. And I, I'm sorry now. I, I wanted to hear what I had said. <laughs> but it started with John. Very beautiful discussion about here and now. Beautiful. So I think a lot of value has been said in this meeting. Um, I say that because my intention here is to is to edit this down into a shorter video.
under an hour, I hope, maybe shorter, and, and put it online. And to keep on having meetings like this um, periodically to see what questions may arise. Um, I have a selfish motive for this. It's much easier for me to do this than to sit there and write, type. <laughs> so I prefer to move the question venue away from the message box and, and onto uh, periodic zoom, zooming into, uh, zooming into the 10,000 things and what's, what I'm, what I'm expressing there. And Catania, hi Catania, how are you? That's the famous Catania. Hi, I've heard about her. Hello, everybody online? Yeah, yeah. Hello. <laughs> hi, how are you? <laughs> you, look, you, look, you look much better than in reality than in the pictures even that well, your, uh, your husband takes. Actually, you're fabulous. Thank you. And your old man's not too bad either. He's a pretty good I dude. So I think he's beautiful. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Here we go. This is perfect, man. Sounds true. Could offer this <laughs> spirituality form. Just spirituality form. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh God! What I I, I really love this. The, the, this this uh, freedom of this form of expression is quite lovely, actually. It's, um, it's, I've gotten many letters recently praising me for being honest. And I want to say something about that, at least for the record. There's only a few of us listening at this point. I talked about radical self-honesty and that... And so the thing that people perceive in me as authenticity or honesty is really self-honesty. I'm just being honest with myself. I'm constantly. I mean, that's the best shot I've got. That's what I mean by awake. That's the best shot I've got to understand this mess, is radical self-honesty. Anything less than that delusion is almost inevitable. And even so, it might be inevitable for all we know. Now, that is a pessimistic view, or, or a skeptical view, a stoical view. And I think that that is expressed in the 10,000 things. But the cool thing about that book, this is what I mentioned earlier, the cool thing about that book is there's this other thread that runs through there of although the outcome is our demise, and although we really can't choose any of this, we're more watching in this brief time span we have to be conscious. We're watching a process of life and death. And that is the beauty. Not in escaping from that or in, 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 in you know, morphing and torquing it into something that it isn't in order to take the fear and the blood out of it. But just to actually embrace the, this aliveness itself is the part of the 10,000 things that I think is now making it popular. I've thought about this because the last two or three weeks, it's, I feel this momentum <laughs> and um, it's building. I feel it. I'm not doing it. I'm not trying to whip it up. It just is what it is. Um, and I, I, so I ask myself, well, what's being said here? And I think what's being said is really life affirming in the deepest way that I know how to affirm that this is what we have, this, whatever this is. In this moment, there isn't anything else. There is no Shangri-La, there is no Ramana Maharshi, there's only you. And you know it, you really know it. That's what I think is hopeful about the book. You got to the end and people say, yeah, I really know that. I knew that. He's just giving voice to my 
but to my already known um, intuitions, exactly. And the intuition that I'm getting at in that book I see now is that it's this life and this moment where all the value is. There isn't anything else. I see an invisible thread in the 10,000 thing. And what can't be said is not said. And in that not saying and framing up Around that, you leave it open for one to see for oneself. And there's, again, I mentioned this earlier, but there's no direct pointing there, like so many point and then try to describe it. You take away the supports that hold up beliefs or ideas and think and let those collapse so one may see what is for oneself. And you do it without the framework of theology and mysticism, which is quite refreshing. There's no lineage, there's <laughs> nobody owns the territory. John, I'm so glad you showed up today. It's been I'm I, done. I got I got a lot of you recorded here. It's going to be great to put this on the on YouTube. Yeah. You got you said some really beautiful things, now. and I, I I think I've got it recorded if the tech part of this doesn't fail me. So I I think I've said enough for today. Unless there's any other comments or questions. <laughs>